Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us here tonight. We're very happy to have you. I am Joe Benizia. I am the Chair of Florida Rights of Nature Network and also Communications Director for FloridaRightToCleanWater.org. These are the two organizations that are behind the effort to amend our state constitution, giving every Floridian a fundamental right to clean and healthy waters. I was talking to college students yesterday about our amendment. And at first I gave them a rundown. I detailed a lot of our water quality issues in the state. And then I gave them some examples of how special interests are having an undue influence over environmental policy. I told them about in 2020, when our state legislature preempted the authority of local governments to pass any laws giving citizens any rights to the natural world. And then one young lady raised her hand and she said, she asked, when will polluters stop polluting? I pointed to information that was projected on the front wall having to do with our amendment. And I said, when we stop them. I am not a native Floridian, but I have been down here long enough to have learned that I have to brace myself before every legislative session because of fear of what terrible environmental bill is gonna come down the pike. This year is proving to be no different and some of our speakers may well talk to that tonight. I can tell you that most recently a bill was filed that would preempt the authority of local governments to have anything to make any laws or regulations having to do with water quality, water pollution and wetlands. The need for this amendment has never been greater. And I can tell you that the people want it. Just a few uh, weeks ago in Cape Coral over here, there was an arts and crafts festival. We got over 1600 petitions signed in 14 hours. Couldn't get the petition, the clipboards out quickly enough. And since the beginning of this year, in January, we have noticed a very uh, big uptick in our momentum. So where is our campaign at? Well, we need 900,000 signed and verified petitions by November 30th. This conference is happening tonight because we had made a goal March 1st of having gathered 223,000 petitions to trigger the Supreme Court review. That has not happened. Our best estimate says that we are somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25,000 petitions. Now, when I shared this information the other day during an interview, the interviewer said, Joe, I gotta be honest, those numbers are discouraging. But we kept on talking and this is the point, the man's eagerness to support our effort didn't wane in the least. So after a while, I asked him, why are you willing to put your time and energies into an effort with numbers that are discouraging? After a momentary pause, he said, sissies pick winners. Call a way of saying that this man was not intimidated by the numbers or the odds, and nor should he be. We have still half of this election cycle to go. Things certainly, we know things certainly go viral overnight. We are looking at a springtime in which algal blooms can rival those of 2018, 2019, and this amendment sells itself. If more, if only more people know about it, and if somebody is standing there in front of them with a blank petition to sign. There has never been a more important time for an amendment like this. It can bring the systemic change that we need in Florida. We've got to make this happen. So I am cutting my remarks, keeping them down, the way I would ask all our speakers to do tonight. And I want to introduce our first speaker who doesn't need much of an introduction. And that is Erin Brockovich. She is in Ohio. She's working on the water quality issue over there having to do the train wreck. So Erin, you wanna hop on? Uh, 
I just got a, got a message from Bob Pocock. So he's with Aaron right now. And he says that um, I think they may have dropped off because of connection issues, but um, they're working to fix it. So um, let's continue on. Okay, that's fine. We apologize. <laughs> they're almost here, almost here. But um, as soon as they hop back on, I will let you know. And um, if everyone's cool with it, we'll just break over and, and let Erin speak her, her comments at that time. Okay, uh, we'll just go with the flow. Yep. Then I would like to introduce John Cassani. John is Calusa Water Keeper Emeritus and Water Science and Pos uh, Policy Specialist. John has worked as an ecologist in Florida since 1978 and as a high profile spokesperson for water and land conservation. His views on water policy have been widely published and backed by a long list of scientific publications on topics including biodiversity, biological control of invasive vegetation, fish and amphibian conservation behavior and ecology. John, thank you for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Hey, thanks, Joe, and uh, good to see everybody on this uh, terribly important uh, initiative. It's just an honor to be part of it. Um, I think I know why Joe asked me to kind of lead things off and set the stage because he knows I've been working on and around water for it's going on 45 years now. So I've seen a lot of change uh, that gives me kind of an interesting perspective. And I thought I'd share that with you briefly uh, this evening. Um, so looking back, it just seems like somewhere around 12 to 15 years ago, something really changed uh, in, in the context of water quality and enforcement and compliance. Uh, since the end of the economic recession around 2010, uh, Florida abandoned any reasonable commitment to sustainable growth or the reality of climate change. You know, who could forget the mantra from Governor Rick Scott, come on down. And they came in droves, blindly seeking sunny skies and warm winters. The subsequent outcome of that short-sighted and poorly planned vision uh, generated a new label for Florida as the poster child for toxic algae blooms, disappearing wetlands, seagrass, fish, and wildlife. Um, and, and right about 2010, uh, there were about 2,000 miles of rivers and streams in Florida impaired for nutrient pollution. Uh, but by 2020, in just one decade, the total increased to over 9,000 miles. It's not good news. Uh, spending vast sums of public funds is not the silver bullet for reversing Florida's win uh, water quality decline as unmitigated growth outpaces expensive efforts to restore polluted waters, failing to prevent or even slow the rate of water quality improvement. Reliance on shifting baselines, that may be something you're hearing more about more recently. Uh, shifting baselines for measuring progress has been legitimized as policy in Florida and creates a deceptive and dangerous mirage on progress. The mirage is fading and as harmful algal blooms increase in frequency and severity, while people and wildlife are sickened and local economies suffer, uh, we're, we're running out of time, frankly. There isn't a lot of time to change this trajectory. Uh, Floridians, Floridians are now at an important crossroad uh, to the future where timely and fundamental change is desperately needed. I think we all agree on that. The accelerating decline of Florida's waters is indisputable and the continued trajectory of this crisis won't improve until there's a fundamental shift away from unjust political system that we mm -hmm. exist now, favoring special uh, interest polluters to one that uh, restores every citizen's right to clean water. So kind of my view on how things have changed and hopefully that this, this extremely important movement can, can change that trajectory. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, John. Uh, next speaker I would like to introduce is Maya Van Rossum. But, uh, Maya is the founder of the Green Amendments for Generations. It's a national nonprofit organization dedicated to inspiring passage of green amendments in every state constitution across our nation and also at the federal level when the time is right. She has also been a Delaware Riverkeeper for over 30 years. 
and she has testified by invitation three times before the U.S. Congressional Committees. There's a lot more to say, but um, I think that is good for now, Maya. Thanks so much, Joe, for that kind introduction. Very nice of you. Um, it's truly an honor to be here with our Florida partners. With the proposal of the Florida Right to Clean Water, Florida's version of what I call a Green Amendment, Florida is truly proving itself to be a national leader in the growing realization that while it's important to recognize the right of all people to clean water as an inalienable human right, it's essential that we give these rights highest constitutional standing if we want them to be truly meaningful, accessible, and enforceable when our government fails, when our government officials fail to ensure that all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomics, have the quality water and waterway environments that they need to support their healthy lives. This all volunteer Florida right to clean water effort is not only an inspiration here in the state of Florida, but it's also an inspiration in the 16 other states where similar constitutional Green Amendment environmental rights protections are being pursued. Now, you've already heard about why we need better environmental protections in Florida, and you're going to hear more about that in the speakers to come. But why the Constitution? Well, we need it in the Constitution because the Constitution provides the overarching legal, legal guidance that all government action must conform to. So with the passage of the proposed right to clean water amendment, when the existing system of laws and government in Florida fundamentally fail, whether they fail by circumstance or design, whether they fail intentionally or unintentionally, when they fail to properly protect the clean and healthy waters that present and future generations need, the people of Florida, through their advocacy, their activism, and when necessary, the legal system, will be able to turn to their state constitution to secure the needed protection. Currently, there are already three states that have this kind, that give this kind of highest constitutional protection for the environmental rights of their people. That's Pennsylvania, Montana, and as of last year, the state of New York. The amendments in these three states are proving important and helpful in protecting drinking water supplies and natural water ecosystems from things like PFAS contamination, <laughs> from contamination by long ignored toxic sites, and from, from, from new industrial operations that would inflict unremovable toxic contamination or ecological devastation if they were allowed to move forward. As a result of having a green amendment in these states, they are able to protect the people from the pollution exposures that are having or would are having or would have devastating health consequences from things like cancer um, and other human health harms. But they're also they're not just protecting the 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 health and the vitality of the lives of the people of these three states. Green amendments in these states are also protecting economic vitality. They're protecting ecotourism and recreational businesses dependent upon clean and healthy waters. They're protecting manufacturing and desirable residential and commercial development projects and other economic operations that need healthy water systems to sustain their income, their operations, and their worker base. The Florida right to clean water is not about lawsuits, as the opposition suggests. To the contrary, it is about ensuring that better government decisions will be advanced that will avoid the human health and environmental harms that cause the need for lawsuits. We are not seeing a mass proliferation of lawsuits in Pennsylvania, New York, or Montana. We wouldn't expect it to see it. We wouldn't expect to see it here in the state of Florida. And I just want to conclude by saying, you know, or recognizing that given that we all depend upon clean water and healthy environments to sustain and support every aspect of our healthy lives, it is right and appropriate that they should be protected with the same legal vigor that we protect the other human, civil, and political rights that we hold dear. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Maya, and thank you coming, for coming down in January for that uh, two-week tour. It was instrumental.
Our campaign was also very fortunate and happy to see not one, but two articles appear about our amendment in Florida Sportsman Magazine. Our next speaker is Blair Wickstrom. He is the senior editor of Florida Sportsman's Magazine. He's also board president of BoatWater.org, board member of Friends of the Everglades, and board member of the Rivers Coalition. Blair? Hi, and thanks for having me uh, tonight, and thanks to all of you for uh, participating. It, uh, it really does make a difference, and I'll touch on that in a minute, but now um, we are the, the state's largest fishing uh, and outdoor magazine, and uh, we're in our 53rd year, and uh, it's, it's in the state of Florida, it's a big business. Fishing is a big business, but it's also a way of life. Um, in fact, the recent AARP survey surveyed men over 65, and they said that the number one activity, the number one activity ahead of visiting and spending time with grandchildren was fishing. Um, in the state, uh, 3 million people fish. It uh, contributes to the bottom line $10 billion from the fishing, marine, and boating sectors. Um, the industry supports over 80,000 jobs. So this is, to the state of Florida, it's a big business. Um, and as I mentioned, a way of life. Um, but the thing is, without fish, there is no industry. There is no way of life. And without clean and healthy water, there are no fish. And so it's crazy that we don't have a stronger uh, influence with our lawmakers. Uh, considering how important uh, fishing in the outdoors is to everybody that lives in the state of Florida. But we've got, unfortunately, two much smaller but more politically effective industries in the state that do a much better job of getting to the politicians, our elected officials, and getting them to do essentially what they want. And these two industries are much smaller. They don't contribute uh, really anything much that we need in the state of Florida. And that's big sugar in the way of ag um, and the phosphate industry. And so it's, it's just crazy that we, we do allow these two very small in compared to um, tourism and fishing uh, to to sort of dominate the way they do in Tallahassee and Washington. And it's not too unsurprising when you look at the number, the small army of lobbyists that these two industries have in Tallahassee. And that's that's why we're here today, is because we can't get our elected leaders to do what we would like them to do. Um, and, it, and it sort of gets me to a point where we were 30 years ago with a similar situation, but even a smaller industry, the commercial fishing industry. And as recreational anglers, we were doing everything we could to try to improve fishing in the state of Florida for the people of the state of Florida. And uh, so sort of like now, we were running into situations where we couldn't get, this was in the early 90s, 1992, after three successive years of not getting gear restrictions on some of the commercial equipment that was being used to gill net, in this case, in most cases uh, that was affected by this mullet fishing in the state of Florida, we couldn't get gear restriction passed. So what we, after three years of not being able to get uh, a bill out of committee, in 1992, our magazine launched a similar initiative to this. Totally by volunteers, we launched the Save Our Sea Life Amendment. We had two years to raise, well, two years to, in, in our case, 482,000 signatures. So almost uh, half of what's required now. So it was, a, it was a big lift then, it's even a bigger lift now, but we were successfully able to get the ballot, get the initiative, 
Save Our Sea Life initiative on the 1994 ballot, and it passed overwhelmingly. Over 70% of the people that voted, voted in favor of it. And uh, so again, it's, it's one of those things where it can be done. It takes a lot of work, as everybody here knows. But more importantly, it can be done. And, uh, and, and, and that's, that's sort of where we are today. And, uh, and in, in our case, today, we're not talking about gear restrictions and, and, and gear that, you know, was sort of uh, uh, the, the issue of the day. John Consani mentioned the idea that, you know, things have progressively gotten worse on the pollution side. Um, I think today, what we're dealing with uh, is, is not allocation issues on the commercial side. It's not gear. It, it's straight up fishable waters. We do not have a forecast that really points to better days ahead, better fishing ahead. It's all going down. Mm -hmm. It's nothing is positive when it comes to the idea that our waters are getting you know better they're getting managed more properly they're 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 at a point where we we can start to all just relax a little bit and and go fishing so i i'll just sort of end with number one we've done it before with total volunteers and i think it's more important today than ever i think this amendment is more important than the gillnet ban in 1994 and again um just with without a doubt i think i'll just close with if we can get this initiative on the ballot in 2024 i know it will pass overwhelmingly thanks thank you Blair. yes we are very confident that once it's on the ballot it will pass there is a history in florida of floridians supporting environmental initiatives thanks i would like uh, to ask uh, laura lee uh, thompson now as our, to be our next speaker Laura Lee is a former commercial fisherman and co-owner of the Dixie Crossroads Seafood Restaurant. A fifth generation Floridian, Laura Lee has witnessed the former glory and current demise of the Indian River Lagoon, once one of North America's most biologically diverse estuaries. Founder of the acclaimed Space Coast Birding and Wildlife Festival, she has served on numerous boards and commissions dealing with fisheries environment, tourism, land use, and growth management, and coastal restoration and resiliency. Laura Lee, thanks for being with us today. Well, thanks for inviting me. It, it's kind of overwhelming to be included with such an amazing group of people. Um, I've been involved in the seafood industry for nearly 70 years now, and I'm lucky because I got to experience the Indian River when it was crystal clear and full of life, and it breaks my heart now to see what the river has become. 40 years ago, my parents started a seafood restaurant in Titusville. Their menu mainly consisted of fresh Indian River product. Today, I serve nothing from the Indian River from the, I, I serve nothing from the Indian River. I can't even get local mullet. And gear restrictions, they haven't worked because our water is a toilet and, you know, and, and stopping people from fishing doesn't work. 15 years ago, there were a half dozen redfish tournaments every year that were based out of Titus Hill and fishermen filled our hotels and restaurants. It's been a long, long time since we've enjoyed the excitement of a fishing tournament with all the money that it brings to the communities where they have them. Numerous ce celebrity fishing shows formerly filmed here. The publicity was amazing and people came from all over the world to fish. It's been many, many years since a TV show has been filmed here. 150 fishing guides once held conditional use permits to take their climate clients into the waters of the nearby Merritt Island Wildlife Refuge. Their clients spent millions of dollars in our community. Today, less than 50 guides hold permits to fish the refuge. Most of the guides that used to work here, they moved to other places where they have clean water and they can catch and keep fish. The response from regulatory agencies has been to lower bag limits and established seasons. You can't keep a redfish from the Indian River if you're lucky enough to catch one now. Gag grouper, they're out in the ocean, but they're soon to be placed under draconian reductions in bag limits. Guess what? 
gag grouper use oyster beds in estuaries when they're babies before they move out into the ocean. And they're essential to both our commercial and our recreational fisheries. Fishermen from all over Florida, they've been sounding the alarm in vain for decades over estuarine water quality. They beg for something to be done about the ever increasing pollution that pours into Florida's waterways. But it's easier to stop folks from fishing than it is to clean up the mess where the fish live. In 2016, I went kayaking in the river with a small cut on my right foot. And I got my feet wet and I ended up going to the wound care center at Advent Hospital twice a week for the next four months as a result of the infection that I got. I almost lost my foot. In 2020, Titusville had a massive sewage spill that went into the river. 7 million gallons, that's what they admitted that they dumped. I believe it was much, much more. The stench from sewage and thousands of dead fish, it was unbearable. Residents and visitors were absolutely appalled. So when warning signs were finally put up, one teeny tiny little sign was posted by a dumpster at a nearby beach that's heavily used by water sport lovers. And that beach is a half a mile long. A little boy who went paddle boarding, he got a bacterial infection that's caused by sewage. Now he's paralyzed and he'll have lifelong health issues from swimming in the Indian River. Other people have lost their lives and limbs from recreating in the Indian River. So guys, these issues, they're not just confined to just the Indian River. They exist all over our state in our estuaries, our lakes, our rivers and springs. I've attended numerous city council, county commission and tourism meetings trying to get our leaders to understand the impact that unclean waters have on my business and others. My words fall on deaf ears. How can they not understand that Florida's water quality is critical to our tourism industry? Visitors, when they come here, they wanna eat local Florida seafood. They don't wanna eat the same imported stuff they get at restaurants where they came from. Everybody wants to swim in safe waters. Waterfront homeowners, they wanna fish from their, front, their yards and not have dead manatees washing up. As the word spreads about the deplorable condition of Florida's waterways, we won't be able to attract workers for our industries. They will go to other places where it's safe to play in the water and eat the fish that they catch. They don't have to come to Florida where you can die just from going swimming. Dirty water is bad for tourism, it's bad for business, and it's bad for our residents. It's time for our leaders to recognize that not everyone who comes to Florida goes to theme parks. Clean water is crucial to our state's economy. I believe that the Florida Right to Clean Water constitutional amendment is the only path forward. Nothing else has worked. Thank you. Thank you, Laura Lee. Our next speaker is Jane West. She is policy and planning director for 1000 Friends. She has been practicing law for 21 years and is, and is an AV rated attorney admitted to the US Supreme Court, the seventh and 11th US Court of Appeals and the Southern and Middle Districts of Florida. She is highly knowledgeable on comprehensive plan amendments and zoning matters. She currently serves as the chairperson of the City of St. Augustine Beach's Planning and Zoning Board and was the founding member of the president of St. John's Association of Women Lawyers. Jane. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And Laura Lee, I, I just really, uh, your, your comments really resonated with me. My 13 year old son is a, an avid fisherman and he uh, also contracted those same sort of wounds on his feet when he went wading into our, our local tidal area to go fishing for redfish. So uh, that, that really uh, got to me. So thank you for sharing that. Also love your restaurant. Um, I can tell you as, a, <laughs> as a, a practicing environmental and land use attorney for uh, well over two decades here in the state of Florida, I can tell you the litigation is not working. I have been involved in many, many cases over the years, everything from challenging the minimum flows and levels that uh, are hurting our springs to beach nourishment projects, and it's just not working. I think one of the most prime examples of that 
for example, is the, the five decade long fight to remove Rodman Dam. You know, one of the biggest acts that we could do in the state of Florida is remove the Rodman Dam so we can have over 20 springs flow again that are being submerged by the Rodman Reservoir and have that freshwater flow back into the St. John's River. And we have not been able to get that done through lobbying for five decades, through federal litigation that went up to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeal. <laughs> through working on the back channels with the agencies, with DEP, with the water management districts, none of that worked. And here we are with a dam that's on the verge of collapse. It doesn't have any useful function. It doesn't create power. It, it doesn't have any sort of use whatsoever, except catering to a, a couple of cronies in my current hometown of Palaka. I live on the St. John's River in Palaka, and I will tell you that um, the Bass Masters tournament didn't come to Palaka this year. You want to know why? Because the bass fishermen last year were complaining so much about the lack of seagrass and they could not get any fish. So they moved down to Lake O. I don't know how that's going to go for them down there. But the point is, this is affecting our local economy. Palaka can't take that economic hit, I can assure you. Um, so I, I will share with you that. Florida is really unique. We, we are not New England where we're dealing with hazardous waste issues as our, our primary environmental threat. The, the biggest environmental threat to Florida beyond sea level rise is the conversion of raw natural land into sprawling development because the domino effect from that conversion of raw land to sprawling development basically basically caters down to every other part, including impaired water quality throughout the state. There has been a systematic and intentional whittling away of the ability for Florida citizens to have a voice on the state of their economy. Let's just go back, for example, to the beginning of our current governor's um, administration. He set up the Blue Green Algae Task Force. Do you remember he got elected? <laughs> our, our Indian River Lagoon was basically avocado soup, right? So there was an outcry, a bipartisan outcry throughout the entire state for something to be done. So what does he do? He sets up a task force. That's great. You know, everyone was kind of excited. This task force was uh, loaded up with really brilliant minds. It traveled all over the state. Uh, lots of resources and public input went into it. Do you know that hardly any of the recommendations from that blue green algae task force have actually been implemented? There are bills pending right now in the legislature and you know, God, I really hope they pass, but I am not terribly optimistic. Some of the very simple um, recommendations stemming from the blue green algae task force in, include a, a mandate that um, septic tanks get inspected and monitored. Like, really? That's not happening right now? <laughs> you know, come on. Um, another one is our basin management action programs. They wholly fail to incorporate population growth projections, just as the state of Florida is seeing an explosion of population growth. Does that make any sense that we're staying with stagnant projections for our BMAPs? No, obviously not. Currently, the agricultural industry has a presumption of compliance in verifying their best management practice effectiveness. It's not working. I can tell you we can complain all day about septic tanks. They are horrible. They're a huge problem. But the number one contributor to impaired water quality in the state of Florida is big ag. And are we going to deal with that? No, because I can tell you as a lobbyist in Tallahassee, and I'll be there next week, by the way, for the start of session. Um, there is such a strong special interest component in the legislature right now that prohibit any sort of forward movement on curtailing the activities that Big Ag is engaged in. So the litigation isn't working. Lobbying isn't working. This is, in my personal opinion, as a practicing environmental and land use lawyer in the state of Florida, this is the only path forward for us. If we don't make meaningful action on this constitutional amendment, I, I really don't see how the peninsula is going to continue to function with good water quality and quantity moving forward. So let's get this done, people. I'm happy to be a part of the effort. And thank you so much for inviting me.
Thank you, Jane. Uh, one of our attendees uh, in the chat said paradigm shift. Does our amendment represent a paradigm shift to you? Are you asking me? Joe? I am, yes. 100%, right? Because the, the actions that we have um, taken so far simply are not working. Um, and in fact, what we're seeing now in the legislature is a slew of bills that are actually seeking to curtail even more the ability for citizens to engage. Um, there's a bill pending right now that would prohibit any sort of referendum or initiative process for land development regulation amendments. So you, you can't litigate, you can't lobby, and now you can't even have a referendum put on your local ballot. Are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> this is the muzzling of the entire um, state of Florida in terms of citizen engagement. And it, it's catering very much to special interests. And it's really, really unfortunate. Um, we have a slew of bad bills uh, pending this session. And uh, I, I would really urge you to reach out to your lawmakers and put that pressure on. Ask them, what are you doing to make sure that you, you are protecting water quality in the state of Florida? And hold them to it. Look, Go on to the House and Senate websites, look up your legislator, see what their sponsored bills are. If you have any questions, give me a call. I'm happy to walk you through it. Terrific. Thank you, Jane. Our next speaker is Charlie Andrews. Charlie uh, graduated from San uh, Jose State University with a BS in 1967 and from Santa Clara in 1969 with an MBA. He worked in Silicon Valley for four years when he relocated to Florida and worked with children in a hortotherapy program for three years. He began farming commercially and organically in 1986. He is the owner of Hammock Hollow Farm in North Central Florida, and he has also done consulting internationally. Charlie, floor is yours. Mm -hmm. I, I thank you very much uh, for the privilege of uh, speaking uh, as, a, as a simple farmer, and uh, I'm, I'm just overwhelmed by my pre the previous guest uh so articulate and, and to the point and i apologize that um, i can't um, i don't know i don't apologize for anything but anyway i am a farmer i would like to start out by saying that uh, just a little background my family moved here to florida in the late 1940s uh to madeira beach and i was about eight nine years old then and the water clarity and everything that's been presented before us was for uh, for me as an eight or nine year old splashing out on a white sandy beach crystal clear water fish jumping was totally incredible experience it has stayed me it has stayed with me through through my lifetime i'm 81 now but the thing is that the the clear water in the gulf of mexico and uh the, the uh, boca ciega bay we lived on madeira beach then the dredging started in the late uh, 1940s and then all through the 50s it ramped up with very little leg uh, any restrictions it was minimal to for the <laughs> uh, development of uh, waterfront property for the um for the, for, the, for the people that um, that sold the property, but but uh, that resulted in a lot of the uh, grass beds that uh, that around the Bay Area and and then in, in the shallow Gulf, which were actually the nursery grounds. A lot of the fish and uh, marine and aquatic life took a hit, and then. We know the rest of the story there about the quality of the water, the salt water in, in that area. I'd like to fast forward to uh, 1978 is when I uh, came back from California. I bought um, a few acres of land and added on since then. We're in North Central Florida, gorgeous area, absolutely gorgeous. We live in a hardwood hammock. It's, uh, there's an orange grove down uh, from us that was established in uh, 1854. It's just about done now because of the greening. But one thing that excited me was the the quality of the uh, the earth here, and uh, 
I started farming and uh, a garden area and then, uh, then established a commercial farm in 1986. We certified the farm organic in 1989. It was continuously certified up till um, pre uh, recently. Um, but one thing about this area that was really just to me was always a magnet was the beautiful, beautiful artesian springs, crystal clear water in the 70s, and the 80s. But then somehow along in the in later 90s and 2000, uh, the, the springs didn't seem quite, they started to seem not as clear. Couldn't, there were certain real deep areas. You could see the bottom, but it, it wasn't the same. And the thing is that, that I, as a farmer, started to realize that, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to farm organically was, you know, to take care of the land and, and basically myself. I didn't want to be in the midst of a chemical cloud I was applying to the, to the landscape. But it's the nitrogen that's leached from these big industrial farming projects that are north of us here, especially cotton and, and uh and some of the uh, other crops that are grown commercially up in the Panhandle, North Florida, and then in Georgia, it uh, leaches down into the aquifer and causes this uh, algae in starting to get in. We get our water tested here at the farm uh, every other year for E. coli and coliform. Uh, it's, it's been, it's been not. Uh, it, we haven't had any incidents at all. But um, I, I would just like to say that, try to finish up here uh, by saying that uh, we, on our walk-in cooler to our farm here, we have a bunch of environmental stickers, the Sierra Club, uh, this and that. We have one from the um, uh, American Farmland Trust that says, no farms, no food. Well, uh, the thing is, I think there there'll probably be a, a, a sticker sometime, hopefully not. It'll say, no water, no farms. I'd like to read a quote that, that has stuck with me through several years that I just ran across before Joe was uh, nice enough to ask me to, to make a presentation or a speech. And this is it, quote. Act politically means networking, networking with your fellow Greens and holding accountable politicians who ignore our common interest in health and resilience of the world or who find it financially or politically expedient to represent the interest of those who profit from pollution, sustainable education of our natural resources. Frederick C. Rich. I thank you very much. And again, I, I, I feel very privileged to be in, in just speaking and saying my piece in the, in the company of the previous speakers. And thank you all. And you're all welcome, if you're ever in the area, to come and visit and here at the farm. And, um, and again, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Our next speaker will be Paul Arsenault. Paul Arsenault grew up in Hingham, Massachusetts, where his love for the sea and travel emerged. Following his graduation from the Art Institute of Boston, he arrived in Florida in 1973 and began his professional painting career. With Naples as his base, he has been painting Florida's waters for 50 years. Annual fundraising shows have been a hallmark of his career, benefiting a variety of nonprofit organizations devoted to health, environmental protection, and historic preservation. His vibrant and widely collected paintings reflect a rhythm and pattern that distinguish his style. His lifelong pursuit to paint contemporary life in coastal communities is enhanced by his passion for history and his natural storytelling ability. Paul, welcome and you should have the ability to share your screen. Thank you, Joe. And um, and thanks a lot. It's it's a great honor to be a part of this uh, this panel. 
and um, there's no greater uh, or more important subject than to um, find solutions to uh, to our water crisis. And um, if you hear me uh, coughing, uh, it's because um, a block away is um, is the Gulf, and we've got a bad red tide. There's a lot of big fish washing ashore, and uh, so bear with me. <clears throat> and thank you again for this event. I've always lived near the water. I grew up in a picturesque harbor town at uh, south shore of Boston. My grandfather had lumber schooners and shipped out of Provincetown, Mass. Uh, this famous postcard shows uh, his boat on the right, uh, the Marjorie Austin, um, and uh, it's being painted by an art student uh, of the art colony of Provincetown. Um, uh, there was always a, um, a maritime heritage in the family. Two weeks after graduating from the Art Institute of Boston, um, I, um, I signed aboard this ship, the RV Gosnold out of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. We worked the summer and fall uh, uh, with geologists, uh, but then were sent to Florida. Uh, leaving the cold gray brown New England, coming to Florida and entering the, uh, the Indian River Lagoon was a wonderful surprise. Vivid light, color, lush, tropical palms, blossoms, fish jumping, pelicans gliding, a paradise. And as I continue, I'm going to show random paintings I've done for the last 50 years uh, in Florida here. Uh, our ship was sent to uh, Fort Pierce, uh, to the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. We were to work with the Smithsonian collecting samples uh, of marine life and water from the Gulf Stream to the Indian River. The projected population boom required uh, a baseline status of the, uh, the bounty and health of the aquatic world. It went from job to curiosity and then fascination. When I began to paint the waterfront, I learned right away it's better to come home with an image and a story about the place. If I couldn't find that, uh, th that story on location, I looked it up. <clears throat> I learned and met the, uh, a lot of heroes of uh, the Florida environmental movement. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, Nathaniel Reed, Franklin Adams, and many more. The story that slowly emerged was the growing threat and the problems. They became more severe and the pattern and cause and effect more obvious. Agricultural runoff, septic, cattle, industrial waste, polluters paid the fines and nothing changed. There are no successful solutions unless Ta Tallahassee changes course. The token measures Tallahassee is providing are political half measures that are meaningless to the, the accelerating scale of degradation and loss of this rich water paradise. I would like to quote John Cassani here, uh, the proposal the proposal right to clean water state constitutional amendment may be the last meaningful opportunity to turn the tide on Florida's rapidly declining waters. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Love the paintings. <laughs> so you have to uh, stop your screen sharing. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, I get my mistake. You did. Okay. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Gil Smart. Yes, so beautiful. Thank you, indeed. Uh, Gil is Vote Water Executive Director with more than three decades of experience as a high profile newspaper columnist and investigative reporter. Gil's a longtime champion of environmental causes who began work as Friends of the Everglades Policy Director in March of 2021 and was named Head of Vote Water eight months later. From 2015 to 2021, he worked as a columnist and editorial writer for TC Palm and the Treasure Coast, 
excuse me, Treasure Coast newspapers in Florida. Following a 21 year career as columnist, editor, investigative reporter, blogger, and video blogger at Lancaster newspapers in his native Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and five years as a community newspaper editor and writer in Pittsburgh. Gil, thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Thanks for having me, Joe. So uh, my organization, Vote Water, is based out of Stewart. And we're dedicated to the notion that Florida's water problems are political, ultimately a political problem, and it requires a political solution. We look to support clean water candidates uh, and oppose uh, dirty water candidates. But what if there aren't any clean water candidates? Or more likely, what if the good candidates out there who back good proposals, who back good policies, uh, get snowed under because their opponents are being financed by the polluting industries like the sugar industry, like the phosphate mining industry, like the sprawl industry. That is the reality of politics in Florida and it's why movements like our own, excuse me, have such a hard time gaining traction in Tallahassee. We're outgunned, we're outspent. The polluting industries frankly run the table. We, we did, a, we were curious. So last year we looked up how many lobbyists the sugar industry employ in Tallahassee. We counted 50. So the sugar, big sugar's got 50 lobbyists in Tallahassee. How many lobbyists do environmental organizations have? Far fewer, okay? If you don't have clean water candidates, you're not gonna get clean water policies. And as a result, we see every single year, every single legislative session, damaging policies coming down from Tallahassee, many of which are signed into law. At the top of the hour, Joe talked about one of the worst bills, uh, a pair of bills to come out of Tallahassee this year. This is House Bill 1197 and Senate Bill 1240. That's called Land and Water Management. We're calling this the Dirty Water Act, okay? This preempts the right of local communities, cities, and, and counties to pass their own rules when it comes to water quality, water quantity, pollution control, wetlands, including wetland delineation. All of that would be preempted to the state. And it would undermine a lot of what's already going on out there. Again, I'm, I'm speaking to you from Martin County, Florida, which has a very strict uh, a wetlands ordinance. Basically, we don't permit the destructions of wetlands. If this bill becomes law, that's going away. We will permit the destruction of wetlands. A very simple question about, about these bills has to do with fertilizer ordinances. This is a very simple thing, right? A lot of counties have fertilizer ordinances where they prohibit the use or uh, certain applications of fertilizer certain times of the year. The way this bill is written, those would go. Counties would not have the right to pass even the simplest of measures to do something about water quality, okay? This is the mentality we see out of Tallahassee year after year after year. And the mentality seems to be, oh, it's fine, it's fine. Oh, these people like us are just making a big deal out of nothing, it's fine. Everyone on this call can attest to the fact that it's not fine, okay? So what do you do when, you're the, when, when the other side is running the table like this? What do you do when they're out, when they're out gunning you? What do you do when the special interests run the show? Well, you can't play that game, anymore, right? You know, we're committed to, you know, continuing to work for political solutions and back good, better candidates who hopefully are going to have better policies. But the ultimate re reality here is, you know, at the end of the day, we've been doing that. You've been doing that. Every organization on this call has been doing that. And as we've heard from most of the speakers preceding me, it's gone nowhere. And we're at sort of a crossroads here. We can't keep doing this to Florida's waters. There's going to come a time when they don't bounce back, bounce back. Okay. We've already lost all sorts of you know, revenue, we've already lost all sorts of habitat, we've already had caused ourselves so many problems. This year could be a case in point with a very bad red tide, as Paul just said on the, on the west, west Coast, the threat of a major blue-green algae bloom on Lake Okeechobee this year, both federal and state water managers are predicting that. The possibility that algae is gonna be flushed our way in the St. Lucie uh, Canal, excuse me, Canal, and that we'll have another summer of slime as we did in 2013, 2016, 2018, you know, the threat of environmental crisis, of environmental catastrophe continually hangs over our head and it's because our politicians won't do anything. Enough, enough, all right? Now's the time for a different approach. Now's the time for the constitutional. Thank you. Super, thank you, Gil. Our next speaker is Bean Fur. Bean, uh, Bean is a Broward County Commissioner. In 2018, he served as mayor of Broward County. Prior to his service on the Broward County Commission, he was elected and served as Hollywood City Commissioner for 12 consecutive years. Beam, thank you for being here. Thank you, Joseph. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you to all the speakers. 
Um, I am encouraged by listening to all of you, even even though I know everybody's kind of it, it, there's a depressive feel to the to the air right here, uh, and and I think uh, you know and understandably, but I I think I don't think you all realize how much how much you're actually getting through. I'm actually think I was at a meeting the other day with seven counties, with the South Florida Regional Planning Council and the Treasure Coast. Gil, this is from Martin all the way down. Um, all seven counties. What they were saying, the number one topic was was water. So, you know, for for various reasons, because it's it's really be for most of us, it's a it, I think for most people, it has become a bipartisan issue. It is, you know, it's one of those things that, Gil, you know, you're over there on the West Coast, you can't even breathe over there right now. You know, all those businesses up and down, that's a, that's a disaster. What we're, what we're seeing on our side are all the corals dying. And we know why, we know what's happening. Um, so what, I, you know, I, what I'm seeing is actually, a lot of times you don't see, you know, you feel like you're not getting anywhere. And then suddenly you do hit a tipping point. I don't think you're that far from a tipping point. And I, and I think Joe, Joe, when you had your uh, your editorial was in our paper over here, um, and I'm you know I'm sure people read that and and you know got a lot out of it. Uh, you're seeing you know you're seeing with the uh, collection of all all the newspapers with climate change uh, on the invading sea. You're seeing. When, when, when issues are of such a magnitude, for the first time ever, those newspapers are collectively working together um, and, and putting forth those articles like you, like you, you had, Joe. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I do think you wanna keep working on parallel tracks. Uh, um, this amendment, I think, uh, as, as some of you have said, have said that you think it's the, the uh, the only chance. I hope it's not the only chance. Um, I think it is a would be a powerful tool, and I'm glad the Latu already passed it and Orange passed it. Um, but I I I also want to. I do feel like um, political solu solutions. It, I know I know when I see what's in Cal has right now, it's pretty tough. But when I saw what was just recently with with all these counties that were working together. On the planning councils, it gave me it gave me some hope. Today, I was at a meeting um, that was discussing the port, uh, Port Everglades, and to make sure that you know I if, I don't know if everybody knows, but when Miami did their port, it was a disaster environmentally. Uh, many corals got killed. It may have started. Who knows if it started the Sony coral disease? I don't know. It could have, but. Um, what you're seeing is now before uh, our county is going out, and I think our, our county is actually considered a, uh, much like what Maya has with the uh, Green Amendment, our, our charter actually has that, that we can do no harm. So, you know, before we go do this today, the whole topic was, how are we going to to make sure that there's no damage done? Because there's there's a need to to go deeper on the uh, port. There, the the plan right now is to spend three to four hundred million dollars ahead of time to make sure that there's you know the monitoring's right, the, all those kind of things, um, so that there is you know the, at least it's mitigated. Um, that said, uh, I you know I, I think I, I know it's a big lift. To get this on the on the um, on the ballot, I do think it would pass, and I think it would be real good. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I was talking with the Republican legislator today, asking, you know, you know, explaining it to him, uh, and I have gotten a commitment from one legislature who who said that they would put it in as a bill next year, not this year. Um, and I think that's one of those things that we need to be trying to do. Start finding those legislators that would be uh, willing to put it in, who would be co-sponsors. This is somebody on the House side. Um, so we need to find somebody on the Senate side. 
And we did this, this, the same group that I was working with, um, these two planning councils that, that are, that have almost half of the population of Florida. If you go from Martin County all the way down, we put together um, uh, a couple of years ago, a package that put a, put a border around the uh, coral reef all the way from Martin County, all the way down to Biscayne. And it's now the Kristen Jacobs Coral Reef Conservation Area. It has taken, that was 2018. It's taken since then for EPA and Florida Wildlife Commission to finally get a management plan. But as of this week, this week they finally are getting it together, finally. And there's somebody, we have somebody who's really good uh, on the EPA right now that we should be trying to work with. Her name is Joanna Walzak. And, uh, and that's, She's got, she's in the, she's in the administration, but she is, her heart is to, to make sure that we have saved corals and all that kind of stuff. You know, those are, you know, we have to find those people um, that are, uh, you know, that are kind of in, you know, in places that can do some work uh, and, and, and uh, give them, you know, let them know that we've got their back. I mean, I asked, uh, the South Florida Water Management District, and, and this is something, you know, we may want to do. Um, I said, we need you to raise taxes. I said, you've been rolling back your rate for 10 years in a row. And now, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be done. Septic to sewer conversion, all those kind of things. We need you to raise taxes, but they're not going to do it if they, if there's no cover, they need political cover because, you know, Anytime politicians are, are raising taxes, they get their heads chopped off. So people need to say, and, and I, I, said, I, I put forth and made a motion to, for, for our planning council and for the Treasure Coast to back them so that they would to raise taxes, to be able to pay for the drainage that's needed out of the Everglades from, there's, there's an issue there with gravity fed to pump because of sea level rise. but um those are kind of things we you know let's let's use what what's also there i think there ha i think we have to keep going on parallel tracks but i just want to i i you know i i hear everybody's frustration and i don't i, I just want to encourage you to keep going um because there are people listening um it's not you know we're we're not in the majority by any means but there are people listening and I think your message is getting through to a lot of people. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's not, a, we're not at the tipping point yet, but I don't think we're that far away. The fact that everybody thought that water was the main issue at this conference last week told me something. That surprised me, um, but I was glad to hear it. So um, with that, I'm just, I, I do have to get off to another call, but I applaud you all for, for doing what you're doing. And uh, I'm at your disposal wherever I can help. Okay. Terrific. Thank you, Bean. Certainly good to hear that we're gaining traction. That's what we're seeing on our side. Good. It's good to have it confirmed by somebody else. Yeah, Thanks. it is. Good. I'll see you all later. Yep. And it is now my very special pleasure to introduce our next, next speaker, which is uh, Melissa Martin Mel. Mel is a Florida attorney and a Florida native. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the U.S. Naval Academy in, in Annapolis. She earned a law degree from Barry University School of Law. In 2014, she retired as a Marine Corps Judge Advocate. She did teach at Barry Law as an adjunct law professor on subjects of water pollution, law, and environmental ethics. And certainly worth highlighting, Mel is one of the two primary drafters of our amendment and she is also serving as our campaign coordinator. Mel, floor is yours. Thank you, Joe. When you first said very special guest, I was like, did Aaron hop back on? No. Um, and for those of you who may, <laughs> may have uh, joined us a little late, um, she was there at the very, very beginning, but then had to leave and, and um, was unable to jump back on. So if she does not come back on during the extent of my comments, then that will give us plenty of leverage to 
uh, ensure that she makes a Florida trip in, in the near future. So <laughs> um, guilt leverage. Anyway, so I don't know about you, but just this, um, this last hour, I've been going through uh, a, a, an emotional roller coaster, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, the details of insights and stories and facts and figures and looking at what and remembering what Florida used to be like. Um, it is a, it's soul wrenching. It wrenches my soul. And I wanted to um, impart the fact that I think and I feel that we are all uh, very connected on this visceral level as, um, as Floridians, um, as humans, to be honest, as people who understand and appreciate nature. Um, and I believe that this, this is not just, um, you know, this, this event was kind of entitled a, an all call to action. And we've used the term a watershed moment. This is important stuff. Everyone needs to get on board. But especially after tonight's comments, I, I feel that there's a 911 um, aspect to this, what this really is. And I appreciate Beam's comments as well. I, I see the issue as a box. The, the system itself is a box of not chocolates, but a system of laws that are that sound great and look great on paper. And you have good people in, in place in, in as public officials in, in the regulatory agencies. There are really good people everywhere and doing their best. Um, the problem is the laws, the laws itself themselves. Why the laws aren't detailed enough at the high enough levels they need to be to be effective. So you really have um, uh, a political issue where if the culture is not ripe for uh, environmental protection, they don't have to by law or anything they don't have to protect the environment okay so it's it's right now a very politically dependent system and unfortunately our politics aren't necessarily dependent on facts or evidence but rather as we unfortunately know uh, the power of money so that's where we are and that's the box right um that's not to say keep fighting and keep working within the box it needs to happen. But at the same time, we all need to understand if we care about what we all care about, then we need to think outside the box and do what is necessary, um, what is imperative to do if we are serious about uh, protecting and saving Florida. Okay, so that's the bottom line here. Um, we, all, we all know what needs to happen. So let me talk real quick on how we can make this happen together. Um, of course, the first thing is sign and send in your petition, please. <laughs> not just not just you, but every registered Florida voter in your reach, your family, your friends, people on your network, your circles, your colleagues, people that go to church with you, that that you that your neighbors, you know, um, walk around your neighborhood and say, "Hey, did you sign this yet?" Um, those are the types of actions when you're talking about the scale that is start that we're starting to see um, that need to happen. And you know that would be nice if it was that was just enough. But in addition to that, we need to have people support in whatever way they can. Now that can be um, if you're not working your full time job with lots of kids um, to take care of. And you have time on your hands, you know, you can you can sign up to volunteer. And there are, there's a wide array of different types of uh, volunteer opportunities out there for for everyone who wants to do something. Um, the, the first step, of course, is to register uh, as uh, part of the campaign and we'll we'll uh, hook up with you and explain what what your opportunities are, what your options are. Um, and whether or not you can do that, there's always the option to also donate with whatever you're able to as well. So understanding what this is, is probably the first step for, for everyone. It is, um, 
like I said, I use the word imperative. It is it is truly an imperative that we all take this to heart to, you know, on a serious level um, and relay that to people that we care about and who have like minds, like hearts for Florida. Okay. Um, and, and treat this for what it really is. It's it should be our first priority. No matter what uh, your mission or occupation, you know, your job, whatever you might be doing um, with your time these days, kind of ask yourself what what is more important right now <laughs> than than fixing Florida's system to ensure that the state can be held accountable for its actions with regard to our waters. What could possibly be more important than that? When water equals life, what could be more important than that? Okay, and that is the, the theme that I, I received from you all today and then I'm putting it up in a little um, package and, and giving back to you. What could possibly be more important right now? So please relay that to, to your, your friends and neighbors and family and, and let's get this together. David has a good, uh, comment to be bold, because um, really this is this is a crossroads. This is really the only way forward for systemic, the effective systemic change that we need. Okay, um, there are plenty of more details to get into, but there's a lot of information on the website. Um, probably too much information, <laughs> but we are all here to answer questions, to set up presentations or meetings with your board of directors or um, whomever. So don't be shy. Let us know how we can help you in uh, whatever capacity you, you think you'll be able to help. But please help, bottom line. So I'll give it back to Joe. And I think that we have a little time for some Q&A. Uh, we do, uh, but we have already, we're already 15 minutes past what we uh, really should do. I'm not going to ask our speakers to stay on any longer if they have other things to get to. It's very understandable. Thank you very much for being here tonight, speaking uh, with your expertise and with your passion. Uh, a lot of great testimony. Thank you.